Today we're going to talk about citizenship. Um, this is a fairly broad topic, but it's one that underlies a lot of things that we have been talking about before. So I apologize for the slight return to a more theoretical kind of approach to philosophy, but hopefully this will help illuminate some other things. Anyway, roughly the concern about citizenship is that so far we've primarily been talking either about what the structure of society should be like, whether we should have a democracy, whether we should have uh, human rights, um, whether uh, national borders make moral sense, and we've talked about personal morality, what it's right for you to do in your life, but we haven't so much talked about um, what the appropriate relationship between the individual and the society that she finds herself in is. Uh, nationalism is sort of the closest, but you know, we mostly talked about it in terms of the relationship to the moral community. Citizenship is something more specific. So, here's the big, big deal. Here's why we might want to talk about citizenship as an important moral concept. One is that The moral theory of democracy, at least sort of the core of the mainstream version, is that having a role in your own governance is something of large moral importance. This is kind of the intuitive core of what makes democracy appealing to most people. Uh, on a moral basis, right? There might be practical reasons, but on a moral basis, the idea that you in some sense are in charge of yourself is the intuitive core of what makes democracy appealing. Um, and it also, uh, it's the core of most criticisms of democratic failings, right? So when you hear people make complaints that are like, oh, you know, uh, elections in the United States are just the two versions of the same stuff that you, can, that you can get. It's not really a democracy. What they're talking about is essentially a criticism that it, that it is not possible for people to really effectively participate in their own governance, right? That's the problem if you don't feel that the two political parties in the U.S. Uh, present a real choice, is that you're not really participating if your choice is meaningless. A similar kind of thing, um, when people complain uh, that you know the North Korea calls itself the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, when people complain that this is not an appropriate name, what they're complaining about is to say, look, this this country says that it governs in the interests of the people, um, but people don't really have a say in their governance, right? So. The idea that people are participating in the governance in some meaningful way is central to the moral attraction of democracy. So we need to make some sort of sense out of how this works. The converse of this is that widespread participation is probably needed to sustain democracy. Um, One of the concerns about very thin liberal kinds of democracy is that essentially it doesn't ask enough of people to be self-sustaining. If we think of democracy as just, well, every few years you have a chance, every two years at least, you have a chance to um, kick out whoever is in charge, and then beyond that, your relationship to the whole political life of the nation and the community is relatively thin, that this will not, even the, even the, the limited kinds of democracy that that embodies will not be sustainable. And also lots of the other kinds of goods of democracy will not be sustainable, right? So if the core of democracy is that people get to participate. There are important other aspects of democracy that many people care about, right? A lot of people think of democracy as valuable because it leads to a government that governs in the interests of everyone. A lot of people um, care about 
democracy in part because they think that it leads to a government that makes good decisions, right? Um, if you remember, these were central to Dahl's uh, argument in favor of democracy. If you don't have democracy, <clears throat> the leaders will be A, um, tempted to become selfish because they don't have anyone pressuring them to do what's for good for everyone. So they'll tend to do what's good for them or the people they like or the people they think of as like them. Um, or they will, uh, even if they are sincere and altruistic, they won't have access to the kind of information that they need to make good decisions. One of the advantages often claimed for democracy is a epistemic advantage, an advantage in the kind of knowledge that the leaders are able to have because of the widespread input. But if you don't have effective, responsible participation in the governance of the country, these things look on shaky ground. Um, it becomes much easier for officials who are running things to become corrupt, to become selfish, or even just to make bad decisions if most people in the country are not really paying a lot of attention, um, don't have the knowledge they need to participate, um, and are not actively holding them to account, right? So Kant, for instance, famously claimed that if you get your institutions right, if you build the rules properly, uh, he claimed that the problem of governance can be solved even for a race of devils, right? And this is an influential idea in certain strands of uh, liberal theory. Not all liberals believe this, but it's been influential, this idea that if, if you can get the rules right, then even if everybody is horribly selfish, the system will work well, right? Um, if you're an American, you can recognize in this the, the sort of thumbnail caricature of how separation of powers is supposed to work, right? The idea is that um, we have different elements of our government that share power and hence have to work together in order to get things done. So even if the president, even if Barack Obama was horribly evil and selfish and just cared about what was good for Barack Obama, and even if all the members of Congress were horribly evil and selfish and just cared about what was good for them and their money and their re-election chances, you know, Supreme Court the same, they would have to compromise with each other and work together because otherwise none of them could get anything done. They could all check each other. If Barack Obama just did what was good for Barack Obama, then Congress would stop him. If Congress just did what was good for their own uh, individual ridings, then Obama could veto uh, the laws that came out. And so the idea is if you set the system upright, the fight that they have, they can only resolve by doing something that is good for everybody. Right? The only way that they can find common ground is whatever is good for both of them aside from their selfish interests. Right? So that kind of theory that if you just set the rules upright, the whole system hums along, even if you have horribly evil people in it, uh, is influential in some concepts of liberal theory, but the, the folks who worry about citizenship worry that it, it's not going to work that way. Yes, having good institutions and having good rules will make your political system better, and it might be necessary, right? Even if you have wonderful people who are all totally sincere, if you have crummy rules and institutions that don't work, you may have bad governance. But the folks who worry about citizenship theory, folks who are often called civic Republicans, um, just like small L liberal, these are small R Republicans, um, they worry that no, you need some kind of level of participation uh, and some kind of level of responsible, effective participation in order to keep your system working. Okay, so that's the, the, the pitch. The problem is governance is a pretty specialized endeavor. Uh, you all, at least those of you who are listening to this because you're in my class, you, know, you all are getting two-year degrees, if not PhDs in public policy. You wouldn't need to do that if figuring out good policies was really simple. So the problem is you want everyone to participate, but you need them to participate responsibly, right? If people are just participating at random, this doesn't help anyone. 
And it's not clear that everyone in the society is going to be any good at this, right? This is the core of what's attractive about non-democratic, elitist kinds of rule. They do that. Look, some people are just, you know, some people are better basketball players, some people are better carpenters, and some people are better at governing. And it's not just natural talent. You need to devote time to it in order to be good at it. So it's not that most people have a talent that they could naturally have. It's that they, they're not going to be able to do this unless they're professionals. At the same time, um, not everyone cares about politics, right? Not everyone wants to participate in this way. In fact, the evidence seems to be that most people don't want to participate in politics much beyond periodic elections and maybe some light work in their community. This isn't, you know, it's it's easy to miss when you're a public policy school. Most of us are pretty jazzed about being involved with politics. Most people are not, right? Most people don't care about politics. Um, you can argue about whether or not that is a cause of the system or a or a result of the system, but it's it's a feature of the world. So, what do we do about that? Like I said, one way that people get pushed is into some form of guardianship, into the belief that well, what we need to do is to some degree hand over political decisions to elites who are better at this stuff. Um, but for right now, let's bracket that. Democratic theorists are going to reject that as it's inegalitarian, it's morally wrong, and it's imprudent. The Guardians actually don't do a very good job when we set them up. So the only solution we have left is increase civic virtue. Get people more motivated to participate and better at participating when they do. So what is this thing? What is it that people need to participate? Um, there have been various lists, but most of them break down into four kinds of things that, that, that civic Republicans have thought people need. And these are largely moral virtues. There are certain kinds of skills that people may need, right? Um, you may need some basic understanding of how laws work and how the process works. You may need a certain stock of knowledge. but most civic Republicans have essentially thought the kinds of skills and knowledge you need to acquire are relatively easy to acquire if you are properly motivated to do so and if you have the right sort of intellectual and moral virtues to acquire them. So they focused more on what kind of person do we need our citizens to be. If you're the right kind of person, you're, you're going to go read the newspaper. Right? You're going to get that knowledge naturally. If you're the wrong kind of person, I can put you know the newspaper in front of your face every day and it will not help you become a better citizen. So on this list have tended to be things like general virtues. These are things that are just things that make you a good person, arguably. Um, things like courage, right? You need courage to be a good person arguably, but you also need it to be a good citizen, right? You don't want to have citizens who just knuckle under to whatever the loudest person in the room says. Right? Then then all you're effectively getting is the opinion of the loudest person. You need citizens who are law-abiding, right? It doesn't matter how good your institutions are and how good your rules are if your citizens are not basically inclined to follow them and to do what they say. Uh, I had a friend a few years ago who was Indian, who every time anyone would bring up this idea that India is going to be the next global superpower, his rant he would go on would be about handicapped parking spaces. And what he would say, he would, he would, he would, I wish I could do a good impression of this guy for you because it was a truly epic rant. But basically his, the point of his rant about parking spaces, he would say, look, if you had handicapped parking spaces in India, people would just Park in them all the time. And if the police said something, they would laugh at the police. And the reason he would go on this rant is that this, is, this was, to his mind, and I'm, I'm merely reporting his view of Indians' law-abidingness as an example. I hope I'm not slandering any Indians. But his view, the reason why his concern about how law-abiding his fellow Indians were was a concern about whether they could become a superpower was that the concern was that the willingness and ability to follow rules in your 
personal life spills over to your willingness and ability to follow rules in the larger political sphere. If you're willing to park in the handicapped parking spot and laugh at the police, you're going to be willing to evade the business regulations and laugh at the regulators, is roughly the idea. And you can see in this um, the germ of the sometimes maligned uh, tendency to vote on values in the United States. I'm sure elsewhere, but I'm familiar with the US context. Policy types in particular, there's a tendency for us to snicker at people who vote based on someone's values or vote based on who you'd rather have a beer with or vote based on who you think cares about people like me. But this is not an insane thing to vote on. The idea is that, right, who you would like to have a beer with or who you think cares about people like you is a stand-in for someone who you think is basically a good person. And a lot of civic Republicans have thought that in order to be a good participant in the political life, whether as an average citizen or as a political leader, you, you need to have a lot of the same virtues that a good person has, right? So for people who um, were really upset about Bill Clinton uh, having a relationship with his intern, yeah, it was about sort of seeing him as a venal guy and, and other kinds of reasons that they were angry at him. But at the same time, there was a reasonable sort of concern lurking there that, look, if this guy is willing to, you know, exploit the affections of a younger intern in this kind of very venal way and betray his marriage and these sorts of things, um, you know, how can we trust him to show good character in other sorts of ways, right? As I'm recording this, of course, a very similar scandal is going on with uh, General Petraeus uh, having had an affair. And you might think, look, why are we going to kick this guy out for being head of the CIA uh, because he had an he had an adulterous affair in his personal life, you know, right? What should we be surprised that the person in charge of the folks who do assassinations and torture and stuff is not a paragon of moral virtue, right? But it's not just about, you know, is he you know is he faithful to his wife? It's about do we think that someone who would not be faithful to his wife has the other kinds of virtues necessary to hold public office? Okay. So much for general virtues. On a lot of lists, especially in uh, modern Western thinkers, you find things like economic virtues, right? This is not just, you know, this week with libertarians. You know, Benjamin Franklin talked about a lot this uh, about this a lot. Certainly it is associated particularly with capitalist democracies, but you will see on a lot of, uh, a lot of lists things like thrift and industry and adaptability. And again, similar to the general virtues, the idea is that uh, for people who support these things, the idea is that, um, yeah, these are things that you especially need in the market, essentially, to do well in the market, but you also need them to do well as a participant in the political system. If you are not industrious, if you are lazy, not only will you not have a well-paying job, but you also won't put in the legwork needed to really uh, participate effectively in the political system. Social virtues, these are maybe a little bit more obviously connected. Um, things like independence and an open mind. Some of open mind is also a kind of epistemic virtue. Uh, these are being a good person who relates to others. You know, you want to uh, both care about others and care about their opinions, but also be independent, have opinions of your own that you can contribute. And since political life is fundamentally about what we do with other people, you can see why a lot of civic Republicans would think that you need um, lots of social virtues. You need to be basically uh, someone who can get along with other people, essentially. And finally, um, and this is the maybe the core of it, there are civic Republicans who have, who have said, and then there, there's also a set of particularly political virtues. Things that are aspects of being a good citizen that maybe don't have a lot of application outside the role of citizenship, or at least um, within your role in the political community is where they get their main application. So uh, things like, and there, there is some overlap, right, especially with social virtues, it's kind of a fuzzy line, but things like non-dogmatism, right, uh, not holding 
beliefs that you're unwilling to challenge and change. Right? Uh, respect for others. You know, a willingness to treat people civilly and with respect even if you disagree with them. And these are virtues that particularly allow political life to go forward effectively. Um, if you don't have respect for others, you will, for instance, not work with them well. And if there's one thing that we know about political communities in general and democratic communities in particular, if you want to get things done, you need to find ways to work civilly with people that you disagree with. All right. One central civic virtue uh, that a lot of recent folks have worried about um, and in a lot of ways influenced by Rawls is the idea that a key thing that <clears throat> Pardon me. A key thing that citizens need to have is a commitment to public reasonableness. This is Kim Lucas' term. Other people use slightly different terms. And lying behind this idea, right? What 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 sets up this idea that public reasonableness is especially important is that politics, for most of the civic republicans is not just a space where we bargain about stuff, where we negotiate our interests. Politics is a space where we try to come to agreement about the common good. Right? We, we don't just try to say, look, I'm going to get a little bit of what I want, you're going to get a little bit of what you want, and you know we have a modus vivendi, we, we live with it. What we're trying to do is find what is good for us, what is good for the community, it's a long tradition of concern with this. Um, you know, Rousseau uh, talks about the, the the common good, and the civic republicans, in particular, think that if you are not committed to the public good, if you think of politics as just a space where you come to duke it out and bargain for things with people um, who have other interests, again, the political community falls apart. In order for there to be a political community, you need to think of it as an us. And part of thinking of it as an us is thinking about what is what is our good, what is our common good. And one thing that sustains that is a commitment to giving reasons in public. If we're bargaining, I don't necessarily need to give you a reason for what I want, other than that I want it and I have some power to grant or deny what you want, right? Um, I want chocolate ice cream, you want vanilla ice cream for dessert, we can only buy one. Um, you know, we're just going to have to, we're going to have to bargain. We'll say something, you know, saying, like, right, I'll get vanilla this time and you get chocolate next time, right? Um, I don't have to give a reason for my preference if we're just bargaining. But if I'm trying to convince you that something is in our interests, I need to give you reasons that you can share potentially, right? I need to give you um, reasons that might make sense for you, that you might come to accept. So the idea is that when we're doing politics, we're not just doing something like arguing about what flavor of ice cream that there's no reasons for, right? If I say, look, we should have, um, you know, we should withdraw all of our military from Afghanistan uh, by 2014, and you say, no, 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 we shouldn't, we shouldn't have timelines, we should have benchmarks. Well, then what we, what we ought to have to do is give reasons that the other person can understand and potentially accept for this, right? You're not just going to say, well, I, I just don't like timelines, right? You're going to try to tell me why timelines are bad, why they're bad for us, right? So the first thing is a commitment to giving reasons, to not just saying, you know, I don't like timelines and I have power, so you have to do at least part of what I want, right? You're going to give a reason. You're trying to convince me. Um, another part of public reasonableness, the sort of the publicness of this, is that the reasons have to be ones that everybody at least could accept, regardless of their prior religious or ideological views. This is actually kind of a, 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 a finicky concept, but the basic idea is at least fairly straightforward, even if the, the devil is in the details. The basic idea is that take something like... Um, well, 
we're in Maryland, right? So take something like gay marriage. If we are debating whether or not uh, gay marriage should be allowed, it's not it's not enough for me to just say, well, I, I like, you know, I don't like gay marriage. So no, we shouldn't have it, right? That's not giving a reason at all. But also the publicly reasonable person will be committed to giving reasons that the opponents can accept. So if I just say, well, look, I don't like gay marriage and I don't like it because God said so. That's a reason, but it's a reason that only other people who share my religion will be able to accept. Right? For other people, the fact that, you know, my religion says that God said it's wrong, it's going to be irrelevant to them. Um, it's not a reason that they can accept. So public reasonableness involves not using that kind of reason. If I'm publicly reasonable and I want to make an argument about gay mar against gay marriage or for gay marriage, right, I have to use arguments that are acceptable, that are potentially acceptable to my opponents, that are accessible to them, right? So if I'm arguing for gay marriage, I also can't say, well, I'm for gay marriage because, uh, you know, there is no God, so he didn't tell you anything, right? That's something that religious people can't accept. I need to make arguments like, well, I'm for it because, you know, everyone should be able to uh, make a life with someone who they love, right? And the idea of the value of love is something that people across religious divides should be able to accept and talk about. Doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to agree, right? But if we're arguing about what love is and the value of love, now we're having an argument that people across religious divide can participate intelligibly about. Whereas if I just say, I'm for gay marriage because there's no God, so who cares what your, what your religion book says, right? That's an argument that I've just excluded all the religious people from. We no longer have a common good. Okay. So, why do we care about this? As I pointed out, a lot of this is really tied to the idea that we are looking for a common good. Um, part of it is tied to this equal, moral equality of persons that we've been concerned with from the start. Uh, if I just say, I'm for gay marriage because there's no God, so, so forget your religious book, this is demeaning to people who are religious. This is not showing respect for their moral equality, right? Um, And then one side thing about this that, depending on perspective, could be a pro or a con, public reasonableness arguably particularly benefits marginalized and minority groups in the society. And the reason is pretty straightforward. If we're just having a, a fight, right, or if we're just bargaining, then how much of what I get, how much of what I want I get, is going to be tied to how much power I have, right? So. I mean, yeah, that's what bargaining is, right? If I just say, look, I'm not going to give you a reason why I, you know, why I think we should uh, change the, the withdrawal timeline for Afghanistan. I'm just going to point out that, like, I've got all of these people with money who are ready to uh, put ads on television telling people this is the right thing to do that you can't possibly fight back against. Well, then you have to listen to me, but we haven't made any sort of principled compromise. Um, and who's going to win that argument is now about who has more money, to, to at least to a certain extent. Public reasonableness, ideally, will have particular benefits for, for marginalized groups because now they don't have to rely just on their power, which, you know, ex hypothesi, they're marginalized groups, they don't have a lot of power. Now they can rely upon the power of their reasons, right? So now, instead of uh, you know, gay people who wanted to get married uh, having to say, well, guys, we're stuck. You know, we're some smallish percentage of the population. We will never have a majority of gay people who are going to be directly self-interested in this, who are going to vote for it. So guess it will never happen, right? If everyone in the society is committed to public reasonableness, then people who are, who are not gay, <laughs> um, will listen to the reasons and maybe go, oh, all right, well, look, this doesn't benefit me directly, um, and they can't force me to allow it, but, you know, maybe it's good for everybody overall if we have it, so I'm going to vote for it, right, if everybody's committed to public reasonableness. You know, on the flip side, if you think gay marriage is a bad idea, right, you could imagine that even the, even gay people might 
if you're giving truly public reasons, they might be able to say, huh, okay, well, I see this is beneficial to me, but, you know, I realize now that it's not good for the overall society, so I'm not going to keep pushing for it. Um, but the idea is that uh, marginalized groups, in virtue of being marginalized, uh, typically have reasons on their side disproportionate to the amount of power that they have. Right? I mean, if you want a sort of a quick formal reason for thinking this, you can think of it as, you know, assume that everybody in the country is more or less equally likely to have good views about something, right? Stupidity is pretty evenly distributed in the country. Well, then the, the wealthy and powerful groups will be able to get their stupid ideas implemented more often if all we care about is wealth and power than if what we care about is um, the goodness of your ideas, right? Because you will have good ideas in the marginalized groups that would never have a chance to come out, um, you know, if all we care about is, is the wealth and power that you have in the society. Now, this can be a pro or a con. Uh, lots of people with strong egalitarian tendencies think that this is great. This is a wonderful benefit of public reasonableness. You might worry, well, no, maybe this is a sort of a centrifugal force. It tends to, to, to pull the society apart. And we should, in fact, suppress marginalized groups. Right? Marginalization is good for the unity of society. Um, yeah, most people who care about public reasonableness are also going to think that this is a good thing. But, okay. So all of this sounds pretty wonderful. Why would we never? Why why doesn't everyone just agree with this? Why are we talking about it? Well, the basic problem is, look, this sounds really hard, and it's not clear why any of us should do it. Being a virtuous citizen on the civic republican model is really demanding. You got to cultivate all of these virtues, many of which require giving up your own personal interests for the common good. Once you cultivate those virtues. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to have to participate in politics all the time, right? Instead of every couple of years, I go and wait online for, you know, an hour and then push some buttons, or even, you know what, hey, if I don't care that much, I stay home. Instead of that, suddenly now, I'm going to be reading the newspaper all the time. I'm going to be talking with my fellow citizens. I'm going to go to meetings, right? Oh, man, there's so many meetings you would be at. If you, were, if you were a good civic Republican. You're going to community meetings. You're going to advocacy meetings. You're writing your congressperson. You're writing your president, right? You're writing your party boss. Um, there's a lot of work being a civic Republican. And many classical civic Republicans fully embraced this. Um, Machiavelli, who uh, was a civic Republican, we can talk about the prince versus the discourses if you want. Um, in the discourses, talks about how you need to keep the population poor and the government rich. Um, and this isn't because, you know, he wants to oppress you, at least the Machiavelli of the discourses. The, the Machiavelli of the discourses, the idea is that if wealth and power is concentrated in the government, people will spend their time doing public government-y stuff instead of wasting, you know, fritting away their time in the, in, in the private market. He wanted to focus everyone's time and attention on the government. Um, modern people often say, look, this does, this does not sound like fun. This does not sound like something I want to do. Uh, I want to spend my time on private things. I want to spend time with my, my family. I want to spend time watching TV. Um, as long as the people in charge are not going to, are not going to completely screw things up. You know, I'm happy with it more or less being, I mean, you know, you can say, look, I'm happy with the fact that in the United States, the two parties are very close together on many issues, right? Because I don't want to have to worry about it, right? I don't want to have to worry about if four years from now, suddenly, you know, we are a socialist nation, right? Uh, everyone wears gray jumpsuits and works in collective farms for four years. And then, boom, four years after that, you know, no collective farms, no taxation, no, you know, anarcho-capitalists run the country, right? We don't want that. We want things to be, you know, things change, but they're, you know, pretty stable from one to the other. And that's precisely because then I don't have to worry about it. This is sometimes described as a conflict between um, the liberty of the ancients versus the liberty of the moderns. And even modern civic republicans are typically sensitive to this and are not willing to go as whole hog as classical civic republicans were, folks like the Stoics, um, folks like, uh, you know, Machiavelli, on saying that 
really you ought to devote a huge portion of your life to participating in the political and communal life of your society. So the classical view was that the reason you should do this is that the freedom of self-rule through political participation is better than the kind of freedom you have in your private life. And one, one very common argument for this was that um, in your private life, you're not really free. In your private life, no one is interfering with you, but you're basically a slave of your animal nature. Private life is where you eat tasty food, you know, you, you, you have sex, you wear comfortable clothes, you participate in sports, but all of these are essentially just animal pleasures. You're no more free when you are engaging in those than, uh, than a cat is free or a dog is free, or a cow is free, right? Um, you just, you have an impulse and you react to it. And freedom just means, oh, we, rea we get to react to more of our impulses, right? But that's not true freedom. That's not human freedom. The idea is that human freedom is choice. Human freedom is creating things, creating, co creating community, learning, creating knowledge, right? Um, doing great acts of justice. That's what true human freedom consists in. So um, the reason why you should spend your time going to meetings instead of watching television is that, you know, going to meetings, you're more free, right? And you can see an echo of this in mo modern thought, right? A lot of folks, probably a lot of people who are going to get a public policy degree, if someone said, look, my life is basically just about watching television, right? I go to work, I do my job as well as I need to, and then I come home and watch TV um, until I fall asleep, a lot of people would intuitively feel that like that's, that's kind of a wasted life, right? A lot of people would be, you know, kind of intuitively judgmental of that. And that's the classical Republicans are willing to take that on completely and say, yeah, that's a wasted life. The only non-wasted life is to participate in the public life of your society. Um, this is a very illiberal view, right? Remember, what's part of what's core to liberal political theory is the idea that uh, there's no unique best life. And as a result, in particular, the government should not be in the business of telling you what you ought to do. Uh, civil Republicans say, no, yeah, there is a unique best life. It is participating in search for the common good with your fellow citizens. Okay. Contemporary Republicans who realize that there needs to be some kind of impulse to participation try to soften this a little bit. So a lot of them follow Kimlicka in basically saying, look, um, civic virtue and participation are optional when things are going really well or at least basically well. Everyone should have the capacity to do this. We should make sure everyone is sort of ready to step up. They have the virtues. They have a, rec a, a level of requisite knowledge. They're sort of keeping an eye on things. But the mass of citizenry, in order to sustain the system, maybe they don't always need to be participants. Maybe it's enough if they're kind of guardians, right? If in normal times, most of us, we spend our time in our private lives, you know, we no longer have this view that private choice is not real freedom. You know, we think that it is real freedom. That's what we identify as, as living a free and, and a free life. Um, but we keep an eye on the political system and we have the capabilities to step in and change course, both institutional and legal and in our own virtues, if things start to go poorly. Um, and when things are going poorly, maybe we need to do more, right? Maybe we need to uh, get involved more, but that's that's essentially a break glass capability. It's not something that we think is inherent to the good life. It's something we think that people need to be ready to do to protect whatever other kind of life that they think is good. Um, so if you are skeptical of the very strong gung-ho citizenship view of the ancients, then Contemporary civic Republicans have, have, have tried to soften that, have tried to make this into something that's a little bit weaker. Now, on the other hand, if you're skeptical of 
the soft modern life, uh, you might say, well, look, you can't, if you actually had the virtues, you wouldn't even want to do this, right? You would want to be in, involved in politics. There's no, there's no way to, to sort of split this difference. But what are the big moral debates? Um, and where it hits, where, where the rubber meets the road in policy is, for instance, whether or not the government should do things to try to encourage or even compel people to get the virtues needed to participate and participate, right? Should we have compulsory civic education? Should we have compulsory public education, right? Should we teach people in schools that participating in the public life is a grand and glorious adventure? Um, or is that, you know, creeping totalitarianism? Should we teach people in, and should we teach people in schools that what they ought to be doing is, you know, making a go for themselves in the market and not wasting their time on, uh, you know, on government? Um, not valuing government's role in their lives so much. Okay. Because one of the places where the rubber meets the road is this question of, should the government ensure that people have the civic virtues? Should it take a stand that says either the public life is the one good life or being able to participate in the public life effectively is one element of any good life? The question is, how do we learn this? Because that, that affects what kinds of things ought the government do in order to ensure that we learn it. There are a bunch of theories on this. There's a few standard answers. One is that we learn it through our families. Um, you know, the family is the, is the, is the, the, the first classroom of virtue. Uh, if your family is in good shape, you will learn especially the general virtues, but even some of the political virtues, right? If your family is a stable family, the idea is that you will learn things like how to look out for the good of a group. Some folks have thought that political participation itself is where you learn this, right? Practice makes a perfect view. John Stuart Mill was a big fan of this view. Um, that... Uh, the mere fact of participating will make you better at it, and that's the primary way it happens. And so, for instance, we should accept that most people will be bad at it when they start, but still encourage them to participate. Not restrict this to elites, because then that will become self-perpetuating. People will not be able to be the elites precisely because we don't let them play. Um, a lot of folks, especially contemporary folks, have thought that participation in civil society organizations is an important way that you learn the virtues. Being part of your church being part of, um, you know, your advocacy group or your sports team um, or whatever is a way that you learn virtues applicable to the political life. Similar to the family, the idea is that even if you are treasurer for your baseball team, this may not seem political, but you're learning all sorts of things like compromise, giving public reasons, right, responsibility for a role, responsibility for following the rules, um, and also you're making connections with people in the community, you're building social capital that then helps sustain the system uh, in a larger sense. And then, at least in the West, the lever that governments have spent the most energy on, arguably, is through public education. And here the idea is that a public education does not just arm you with knowledge, it doesn't just tell you facts, a public education is and should be a place where you're trained in virtues. Now, of course, a lot of these things are controversial because in, for the government to get involved in any of these things uh, with an eye towards civic virtue means the government favoring some conceptions of them over the others, right? So if we think that you learn civic virtue through the family <coughs> and that only certain kinds of families properly teach the virtues, now we looks like we're saying the government ought to have a role in deciding what kinds of families are going to be allowed or at least maybe encouraged, right? Maybe you allow any kind of family, but you specially encourage some. Um, if you think that you're doing this through public education, now suddenly, right, you're getting the government involved, not just in teaching you facts, but in training children in what we take to be virtues, training them in, in, you know, having them say the Pledge of Allegiance, having them read the writings of Marx, right? Whatever you think your government is about, you are saying, yeah, the government should probably be involved in shaping young minds. And of course, 
these are fairly standard answers with controversial aspects. <coughs> Two of the answers that have been given for how you learn civic virtue that are sort of controversial in themselves is uh, some people will say you learn it through the market, that you can't be virtuous unless you have capitalism. Uh, this is kind of an interestingly modern view. Most of the classical civic republicans thought that participation in the market was actively detrimental to development of civic virtue because, you know, it required that you be selfish and uh, care about money and, and all these sorts of, be greedy and all these sorts of things. But a lot of contemporary thinkers have said, no, this is basically, this was an old anti-market ideology. Uh, we understand now that markets are actually a place where people learn to be good citizens. Um, and some people have said through religion. A lot of civic Republicans have accepted that participation in religious organizations as, you know, a subset of civil society can be helpful, right? Where being part of my church is kind of like being part of my baseball team, right? It's, it's the fact that I'm in an organization that's helpful. But other folks have said, no, it's, it's religion itself, right? It's not, a church is not just another kind of organization, or a mosque is not just another kind of organization. Religion itself teaches people important virtues that they cannot acquire in non-religious ways, right? Principles of ethics, submission to a greater power, uh, these sorts of things, um, creates value communities. So, controversial answers for obvious reasons, but ones that you can see why people have proposed, that you need these kinds of institutions in order to learn virtue. And for instance, even a lot of folks who are skeptical of the idea that we ought to have a proper religion as a state religion, have worried about replacing it with something else that can do a similar similar thing, right? So John Dewey, for instance, not a noted religious person, talked in a lot of his writings about how America needed to have a civic religion that would not be sectarian and not be God-based, but he thought you needed something that would do the things that religion does. It would have common festivals that bring people together. It would have inspiring stories that, uh, you know, make people feel part of the community. Um, it would teach common values, lots of things that religion is one of the main drivers of in actual societies, right? So even non-religious thinkers, even though this is, of course, quite controversial, non-religious thinkers have often found themselves in the position of saying, maybe we need something that's kind of religion-esque in order to make all of this work. Okay, so to sum up, and there's, of course, lots of stuff that we could have talked about that we didn't, and we can talk about in class, hopefully, if I don't keep yammering on. Um, the whole reason we worry about citizenship is that it may not be possible to solve the problem of government governance for a race of devils. Having a good government may require a certain amount of good people to be part of it. And good in the sense of possibly morally good, but in particular in the sense of being ready, willing, and able to participate in the communal life in a way that is you know, not trivial to be equipped to do that. Endorsing this idea, endorsing that we need good citizens to make a good society, may require promoting a particular concept of the good. Even if you take the kind of softer, modern civic republican view where it's, where it's largely instrumental, you may say, look, it, d people don't need to spend their whole day, as long as things are going well, worrying about politics. But yeah, we're going to inculcate slash indoctrinate everyone in the society, children, whatever, with this idea that at least some degree of participation and knowledge about politics is good and necessary. That, you know, if we think public reasonableness is a virtue, right, that it is not good to make arguments that rely solely on your own particular religion. Or, you know, if we endorse some kind of civic or even regular old state religion, that, no, we're going to have to say it is only good to make arguments that appeal to this particular religion. And if you are a member of minority religion, that's a problem, right? Citizenship, part of this is that citizenship maybe need to be nurtured in the private sphere. And so to the extent that government has an interest in it, government may need to reach into the sphere that a lot of liberal theorists consider private. May need to reach into the family. May need to reach into religion. It may need to reach into speech, right? Um, Plato, 
famously thought that we needed to ban certain kinds of music uh, because it, uh, you know, corrupted the body politic, right? You know, only martial music, I think, should be allowed, right? And a lot of people go, ha, 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 old philosophers like Plato were crazy. But then, you know, in the modern age, we worry about uh, whether or not children should be able to get certain kinds of video games or certain kind or, or certain kinds of music, right? Um, any any album that I have with swear words in it has a little explicit label next to it. So uh, to let parents know that the government says this music may be dangerous to your children, right? Um, so any kind of focus on citizenship may require more government involvement in what we often consider private and what a lot of especially Western democratic theorists have traditionally considered off limits for government um, than otherwise there would be. And one thing to keep in mind is that this isn't just about the regular citizens, right? This whole thing doesn't work unless not only do the regular citizens have virtue, but that um, the representatives or public leaders have virtue as well. But they may need a whole different set of virtues. And it's not clear exactly what the relationship between being a good person, being a good leader is supposed to be, especially when, you know, going back to the stuff about dirty hands, sometimes we seem to expect or even want our leaders to not be good people. And uh, squaring that circle is a difficult one. <laughs>